Welcome to From His Heart with Pastor Jeff Shreve, who's in his new and timely series, The Joy of Christmas. Are you experiencing the joy that comes from a heart that truly believes? Discover how in today's timely lesson, The Joy of Believing. We are starting a new series today called The Joy of Christmas, because Christmas is a time of joy. You know, they, we talk about the Christmas spirit, and the Christmas spirit is one of giving, and it's one of joy. When the angel came to the shepherds in Luke chapter 2, the angel said, Behold, I bring you good news of a great joy, which shall be for all the people. For today in the city of David, a Savior has been born for you who is Christ the Lord. Christmas is a joyous time. It's a time to rejoice and a time to celebrate. Now, the question is very simple, very straightforward. Do you have joy? I'm not talking about happiness. I'm talking about joy. You know, there's a difference between joy and happiness. Happiness is external. Happiness depends on what is happening to you. And if your happenstances are good, you're happy. And if your happenstances are bad, you're unhappy. But joy is not based on circumstances. Joy is something that is deeper. As someone once said, happiness is like a thermometer. It registers conditions. But joy is like a thermostat, and it regulates conditions Joy comes from God. It's, it's one of those things that's part of the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. It comes from God, true joy. You can't have true joy apart from God because it's part of God's things. And you enter into joy when you believe the Lord, when you believe the message that He gives in His Word, when you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. We want to kick off our series, The Joy of Christmas, talking about the joy of believing. And the poster child for belief is somebody that is so misunderstood in the Bible. Her name is Mary. She was chosen to be the mother, the human instrument to bring Jesus Christ into this world. Now, many people are confused about her. The Catholic Church deifies her and says Mary is, uh, she's, she's equal with Jesus and she is also a Savior and you pray to Mary and you worship Mary and we have statues for Mary. And so that's, that's on this uh, one end of the spectrum that is just totally foreign to Scripture. Mary is just a, a person like you and me. She's a sinner like you and me. She needs a Savior just like you and I do. So, on one side, we have people that, that worship Mary. Now, on the other side, we have people that disregard Mary because they're, they're pushing back against this extreme that they see in the Catholic Church. So, they say, no, uh, let's just not really talk about Mary. Listen, Mary is not somebody to be worshipped and adored, and she's not somebody to be walked over and ignored. She's somebody that we can learn from because she is the prototype believer. She is one who had simple, childlike faith. And the Bible records her faith in Luke chapter 1. I'll start reading in verse 26. It says, Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city in Galilee called Nazareth. The sixth month is the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy. 
Elizabeth was talked about in the opening part of chapter 1. And uh, so he's talking about the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy. And Elizabeth is going to give birth to John the Baptist. And that's a miracle in itself because Elizabeth is 60 plus years old, never had a child. She's barren and she is past uh, childbearing. She's gone through the change. And so it's, a, it, it's impossible for her to have a child. But with God, all things are possible. And so Elizabeth now is in her sixth month. Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city in Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the descendants of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And coming in, he, Gabriel, said to her, Hail, favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at this statement and kept pondering what kind of salutation this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall name him Jesus. That name means Jehovah saves. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. And Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I am a virgin? And the angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you, and for that reason the holy offspring shall be called the Son of God. And behold, even your relative Elizabeth has also conceived in her old age, and she who is called barren is now in her sixth month, for nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold the bond slave of the Lord, be it done to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Such a great story that is given in the word of God to tell us how this came about that God would become a man that we would know as Jesus. And Mary heard the announcement from the angel Gabriel and she believed. And Elizabeth, when she sees Mary, she says this to her, and blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what the Lord had spoken to her, what had been spoken to her by the Lord. Hey, here's the question I want you to consider. I asked you the question, do you have joy? Well, this message is called the joy of believing. So have you made the all-important decision to believe God? The all-important decision to believe God. Paul, who was in a terrible storm, told those guys who all thought they were going to die. Paul himself thought he was going to die until he got a visit from an angel himself. He said, don't fear, men. I believe God that it's going to happen just like he said. The joy of believing. Do you believe God? I want to share with you four encouragements from the announcement Gabriel made to Mary from the life of Mary, who was a prototype, uh, uh, somebody to follow in her simple childlike faith and belief. Encouragement number one, you can believe God just like Mary did, even when you're afraid. Even when you are afraid. Now, when the angel showed up, Gabriel, he shows up. It says in chapter one that he, he says to Zacharias, when he visited Zacharias six months earlier, he said, I am Gabriel who stand in the presence of God. He is the mighty messenger of God. Now, any time in the Bible when people would encounter an angel, they would be afraid, seriously afraid. The Roman soldiers, when the angel came and rolled away the stone when Jesus Christ rose from the dead, the Bible says those Roman soldiers who were uh, tough and courageous, they shook with fear and became like dead men because there was uh, the, the fear of the angel. And so the angel says to Mary, do not be afraid. Why? Because she's afraid. Because you'd be afraid, and I'd be afraid, and we'd be afraid. When Gabriel came to Zacharias, who was a priest, probably 70 years old or so, he saw the angel. The Bible says he was gripped with fear. And so here is Mary. Mary's about 14, 15 years old, probably. We don't know for sure, but she's a teenager. 
And so this young girl in Nazareth, she sees a holy angel, and she is afraid. She's greatly troubled. Hail, favored one, the Lord is with you. And she's troubled by that salutation, and she's afraid, but she still believed. Hey, you can believe God even when you are afraid. God has a story after story in the Bible of people who were afraid when the Lord came with a message for them. They were afraid, but they still stepped out in faith. Some of us think, well, you know, in order for me to really have faith, I, I have to have the absence of fear. No, you don't. Fear can be there. The devil uses fear to try and keep us from doing what God wants us to do. Fear is okay as long as your faith is greater than your fear. You know who had fear in the Bible? Moses. Moses was afraid. When he killed the Egyptian, he fled because he was afraid. When he saw God at the burning bush, he, he was afraid to look at God. He was afraid to be, be in the presence of God. He didn't think he could do what God had called him to do to deliver his people. He was afraid, but he stepped out in faith, and God used him. Gideon in the book of Judges, he was so afraid of the Midianites, and God said to him through the angel, uh, Hail, mighty man of valor. And Gideon's like, who are you talking to? And they don't call me mighty man of valor. They call me chicken little. Hey, Kenny Rogers sings about me. I'm the coward of the county. I'm not, I, I, he was afraid, and God used him. He was afraid, but he stepped out in faith in the midst of his fear. Paul was afraid when he was on that shipwreck. And the angel came and said, do not be afraid, Paul, because you're not going to die in this storm. David, who went up against Goliath, he dealt with fear. We know he dealt with fear because he writes about it in Psalm 56, and he says this, when I am afraid, not if I am ever afraid, he says, when I'm afraid, I will put my trust in you, in God whose word I praise, in God I put my trust, I shall not be afraid, what can man do to me. Maybe you're afraid. God tells you, hey, I, I need you to talk to your neighbor about me, to tell your neighbor about Jesus. Uh, Lord, I can't do that. I, I'm too afraid. I don't know what I would say. I, there's, there's fear grips your heart when you sense the Lord wants you to witness. You, you, you sense the Lord wants you to start really giving and honoring him from your wealth, and you become afraid, and you look at uh, how you can't do that, and uh, I don't have enough money to do that, Lord, and you, you're afraid. God calls you to get out of the boat and walk on the water with him, doing something that you don't think is possible, and you're afraid. And you say, well, I can't do that. I'm too afraid. Hey, you can believe God even when you're afraid. Fear is okay as long as your faith is greater than your fear. Mary was dealing with fear, but it didn't stop her from believing God. Second encouragement, you can believe God even when you don't understand. Even when you don't understand. Now look at it again, verse 28. And coming in, the angel said to her, Hail, favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at this statement and kept pondering what kind of salutation this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. And Mary said, How can this be since I'm a virgin? I mean, to hear the message that she was given. Now, remember this, very important. There had been what the theologians call the silent years, the 400-plus silent years between the book of Malachi and the New Testament. God hadn't spoken for all those years. God, there's no miracle in all those years. And now, all of a sudden, the miracles start coming. It was a miracle that Elizabeth was pregnant in her old age, pregnant with John the Baptist, uh, a miracle pregnancy. Now, it's still a man and a woman coming together, and they're having a son. So it's a miracle, but it's not a miracle like this miracle. I mean, this is, you're going to have a son, and he's going to be the Messiah, and he's going to rule, and uh, he's going to be the son of the Most High God. I mean, that, that just blows her mind. She didn't understand how any of this was going to take place. She didn't even understand why the angel was coming to her. Because Mary lived in Nazareth. 
It's called in the Scripture to a city in Galilee called Nazareth. They, they had to identify where it was, what region it was in, because you wouldn't know where it was unless it said it was in Galilee. Why? Because Nazareth is a grease spot in Galilee. It's a nothing place. Remember what uh, Nathaniel said, Nazareth, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? I mean, Nazareth, you talk about backwater, you talk about jerk town uh, Israel, I mean, that's Nazareth. There were probably, as uh, archaeologists have speculated, maybe only 150 people, 200 people lived in Nazareth. I mean, it is small, it is dinky. I mean, they didn't have a stop and go. They had nothing there. I mean, you know, there's not even a stop sign. There's not a four-way intersection in Nazareth, nothing. It's a nothing place. And here she is, a 15-year-old girl living in a nothing place, and the angel comes to her and says, you're the one that God has chosen to be the mother of the Messiah. Well, that just blew her away. She didn't understand how that could possibly be. Why would you come to me? Why are you calling me favored one? Why are you saying I'm greatly graced? How is this going to happen? All sorts of questions. How is God with me? And she didn't understand. Hey, you can believe God even when you don't understand. The Bible says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your path. We like to understand. There's not a problem in trying to understand. She asks the question, how can this be since I'm a virgin? She wants to understand. But so much of what the Lord tells us in his word, we're going to have trouble understanding it. And if you say, well, I'm not going to do what God says until I fully understand the whys and the wherefores, then you're going to be left out in the cold. You're never going to believe God. You're never going to trust God. You're never going to get out of the boat and walk on the water with him. Hey, you can believe him even when you don't understand. And remember this. Mary is a 15-year-old girl living in the backwater town of Nazareth and that God would choose her. And see, here's the thing, too. Mary knows who Mary is. She knows about all the sins she's committed in her life. Just like you know about the sins you've committed, I know about the sins I've committed. She knows about all the struggles she has in her life. She knows she is not worthy for this announcement. You know, when I think about the truth that God loves me, I have a hard time understanding that because I know me. And I think, Lord, how could you love me? I don't love me a lot of the time, and yet you love me? You would die for me? That you would not only love me, but you would die for me? That you would save me when I cried out to you in repentance and faith? And not only love me and die for me and save me, but then you would call me into the ministry? Lord, do you, do you know who, who you got here? I mean, did you get a, a wrong turn somewhere? You came to Nazareth, as Mary would think. Aren't you supposed to go to Jerusalem? That's where the big shots are. I'm, I'm a little shot. I'm, I'm nothing. I'm a nobody. Remember this about God. There is no one too small. For God to use. There are only people too big for God to use. God's opposed to the proud. He gives grace to the humble. And see, when you don't understand, you can still believe God. You can say, I'm going to trust in the Lord with all my heart. I'm not going to lean on my own understanding because I don't have much. And I don't have to understand everything that God says for me to do what God says. We like to ask the question, why? Why? Why, Lord? Why, Lord? Why, Lord, this? Why, Lord, that? Why, Lord, the other? And the Lord says, my child, just trust me and do what I say. Hey, you can believe God even when you're afraid. You can believe God even when you don't understand, and she did not understand. And then on the heels of that, Encouragement number three, you can believe God even when his word seems impossible. When it seems impossible, 
And what she has been told seems impossible. And so she says, verse 34, how can this be since I'm a virgin? Now, she didn't say it with, uh, you know, some skepticism, like, well, I don't believe that. Well, that can't happen because I'm a virgin, so that can't happen. She knew the announcement from that question. She knew that the announcement wasn't an announcement saying, you know, when you and Joseph get married a year from now and then you start having kids, then one of your kids, you're going to name Jesus. No, because then it would be like, okay, well, he's talking about future, and then I, I'm going to have a husband, and then I'm, we're going to uh, have a relationship, a physical relationship as man and wife, and then we're going to have children. So, yeah, that makes sense. No, no, no. She knew that this meant now. Now, because her question doesn't make sense unless she understood that. How can this be since I'm a virgin? And the angel responded in verse 35. He said, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you, and for that reason the holy offspring shall be called the Son of God. And behold, even your relative Elizabeth, uh, a cousin or an aunt, she was much, much older, obviously, than Mary. And behold, even your relative Elizabeth has also conceived a son in her old age, and she who is called barren is now in her sixth month, for nothing will be impossible with God. Mary asked the question, how, how, how's this going to happen? I mean, I don't understand, and what you're telling me is impossible because I'm a virgin, and it's impossible for a virgin to give birth. Now, when the message, Gabriel, the same angel, when he went to Zacharias, Zacharias, who is an old man, as he calls himself, he gets, he's a priest. I mean, he knows way more than Mary knows. Mary being a 15-year-old girl, he's a 70-year-old, roughly, 70-year-old priest studying the, the Old Testament and, and the things of God, he questions the angel. And when Gabriel tells him, hey, you're going to have a son, he's going to be great, you're going to name him John, he's going to be a forerunner of the Messiah, he's coming in the spirit and in the power of Elijah, as the Scripture said in the last book of the Old Testament, the book of Malachi, and he said, how can I know this for certain since I'm an old man and my wife is advanced in years. Now, Zacharias was smart because he didn't say his wife was an old lady. He said she's advanced in years. Now, she wasn't in the room at the time, but he's thinking, man, this could get back to her. So, you know, uh, but he, he asked a skeptical question. How am I going to know this for certain? Mary doesn't ask a question like that. You know, Zacharias asked that kind of question, and the angel said to him, uh, you didn't believe the word that was given to you. I'm Gabriel who stands in the presence of God. You didn't believe. So what you're going to do is you're going to have silence. You're not going to be able to speak until that baby is born. That's going to be the sign for you. Well, Mary doesn't ask for a sign. She just asks a, a believing question. I don't understand. Please help me understand. How is this going to happen? And because she doesn't ask for a sign... She's given a sign, and she said, the angel says, hey, you have a relative, Elizabeth. She's in her sixth month, and nothing will be impossible with God. And you know, when the Lord tells us about the incarnation, about how Jesus came to be in Mary's womb, there's not a lot of fanfare. There's not a lot of fireworks. It's just very straightforward. The power of the Most High will overshadow you. The, uh, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. That's all it's going to be. And for that reason, the offspring shall be called the Son of God. Some people have said concerning the virgin birth of the Lord Jesus Christ, they said, well, you know, you don't have to believe in the virgin birth in order to be a Christian. There's nothing in the uh, Campus Crusade Four Spiritual Laws that talks about the virgin birth. Well, let me tell you what you have to believe in order to become a Christian. You have to believe that Jesus is God. That's what you have to believe. Jesus said, unless you believe I am he, unless you believe I am, you shall all die in your sins. And if Jesus wasn't born of a virgin, if he had an earthly father and an earthly mother, then he'd be just like you, just like me. He'd have a sin nature. 
He would be a sinner. He would be a son of Adam from Adam's lineage in terms of uh, his father being a human. And the Bible says in the book of Psalms, no man can by any means redeem his brother or give to God a ransom for him, for the redemption of his soul is costly. And so how does a sinner redeem a sinner? Can't. You have to have someone who's not a sinner to be the perfect sacrifice, to take on the sin of the whole world. And Jesus, from the announcement of his birth, he is going to be called the Son of God. The Son of Mary, yes, but not the Son of Joseph, the Son of God. Now, this didn't make sense to her. This seemed impossible to her, a virgin, pregnant. But as it says in verse 37, nothing will be impossible with God. You can believe God. Even when his word seems impossible to come to pass, because God is the God of might and miracle. See, you write this down. There is nothing too difficult for God. Nothing too difficult for God. Nothing impossible for God. The Lord says in Jeremiah 32, 27, Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is anything too difficult for me? And the answer is obviously no. Nothing is too difficult for God. In that same chapter, it goes on to say, Ah, oh, Lord God, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and by your outstretched arm. Nothing is too difficult for you. And there is no promise too great for God. Now, here, here's something that's really cool. See, people have said, and, and this is true in one sense, the Jews, when Jesus came, they did not understand that the Messiah was going to be the Son of God. That wasn't in their uh, framework of comprehension. They knew this, the Messiah was going to be the Son of David. That's why when Jesus said to the, to the, the uh, religious leaders, uh, the Christ, whose son is he? And they said, well, he's the Son of David. And then Jesus said, well, how does David Say in the spirit, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. He says that in the book of Psalms. He says, if David calls him Lord, how then is he his son? And you could hear the fuses blowing in their minds. They couldn't understand that. And it's like, how, how, how does this work? How is the Messiah, the son of David, yet he's David's Lord because he's the son of God and the son of man. He's the son of God and the son of Mary. He's the God-man. And the Old Testament, from the fall of man, gave us a promise of his deity. Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. As the Lord is cursing the serpent after Adam and Eve ate the forbidden fruit, he said, I will put enmity, hatred between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head and you shall bruise him on the heel. The seed of the woman. Now, anyone knows, anybody who's studied biology, any doctor in here would know that, well, the woman doesn't have a seed. The woman has an egg. The female has an egg. The male has a seed. But the Bible talks about the seed of the woman. And when we couple Genesis 3.15 with the announcement from Gabriel and what's going to happen with the virgin birth, a, a virgin shall be with child and bring forth a son, we know that this is speaking of the virgin birth of Jesus. He's the one whom the serpent is going to bruise his heel on the cross, but Jesus is going to crush his head. And so God is able to keep his promises. He made that promise right at the fall of man that there was coming a Savior one day who was going to crush the serpent's head. And he was going to be born the seed of a woman. And God is able to keep his promises. As Solomon said in 1 Kings chapter 8, as he dedicated the temple, he said, Blessed be the Lord who has given rest to his people Israel according to all that he promised. Not one word has failed of all his good promise, which he promised through Moses, his servant. As Gabriel said in verse 37, for nothing, not one word will be impossible with God. 
Mary was given all that information. She had fear. She had misunderstanding, a, a, a lack of understanding, and she heard an impossible message, and she responded this way, Behold the bond slave of the Lord, be it done to me according to your word. I receive it. It doesn't make sense. I, this is impossible, but you have told me this, and I believe it, and I receive it. See, there's nothing too difficult for God. There is no promise too great for God, and there is no valid reason to disbelieve God. Now, people have excuses why they don't believe God. As, as John prayed before our offering, prayed that if there are some here today, some watching live streaming, some watching on television, if they haven't put their faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, that they would do that today. Now, people have excuses as to why they don't do that. Well, I just need more information. I, I, I'm just not ready yet. I'm, just, I, I'm having too much fun sowing my wild oats. I'm just, I'm just this. I'm just that. I'm just the other. All these excuses of why they can't give their life to Christ, why they can't believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, why they can't receive his message. You know what an excuse is? An excuse is the skin of a reason stuffed with a lie. That's an excuse. It's like a sausage. It's a, it's a skin of a reason stuffed with a lie because there are no valid reasons to not trust Jesus. Some people say, well, I have intellectual problems. No, you don't. You have sin problems. That's why the Bible says the fool has said in his heart there is no God. He doesn't say that in his head. He says it in his heart. The, the fool, the uh, naval, the morally perverse person, that's what he says. It makes sense to come to Jesus. That's why the Bible says in Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18, Come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. It's a reasonable thing to believe God, to believe the message of God. When the Jews didn't go in the promised land, the children of Israel, when they were supposed to, they didn't believe God. And God said to Moses, How long will this people not believe me? despite all the miracles I have done in their midst. Mary was not slow to believe. Mary had simple, childlike faith. And she said, Behold the bond slave of the Lord. I'm the Lord's slave, doulos, the lowest slave. I, I, be it done to me according to your word. I receive what you say. I love what Augustine said about that. She said, he said this, Mary first conceived Christ in her heart by faith before she conceived Christ in her womb because she believed the message. And Elizabeth is going to say, blessed are you who believed the word that was spoken to her by the Lord. She believed. There is no valid reason to disbelieve God. Now, she has a problem. Who is going to believe her? So the angel departs from her, and at that moment when she believed, boom, she was pregnant. But then who am I going to tell? I guess I could tell Joseph. It tells us in the book of Matthew when Joseph found out he's wanting to divorce her. See, they're engaged. They're not married yet, they're engaged. But an engagement back in that time period, you had to divorce to break the engagement. It's an ironclad deal once you were betrothed. So she tells Joseph he doesn't believe her. Well, who would? She tells her rabbi, and he's not going to believe her. She tells her parents, surely they would believe me. Hey, mom and dad, if your 15-year-old daughter came home and said she was pregnant by the Holy Spirit, how would you handle that? Do you believe that? He'd be like, uh, I don't think that's uh, something I've ever heard of before. Obviously, nobody would believe her except Elizabeth. Elizabeth would believe her. Why? Because she has experienced the miracle herself. She and her husband, Zacharias, know, they knew the message that they had gotten from Gabriel. So what does she do? She goes to see Elizabeth, and that leads us to encouragement number four. You can believe God and experience the joy. Verse 39, 
Now at, the, at this time, Mary arose and went with haste to the hill country, to a city of Judah, and entered the house of Zacharias and greeted Elizabeth. And it came about when, the, when Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And she cried out with a loud voice and said, Blessed among women are you, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And how has it happened to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For behold, when the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby leaped in my womb for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what had been spoken to her by the Lord. And Mary said, My soul exalts the Lord, and my spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior. She's a, she's a sinner in need of a Savior. For he has had regard for the humble state of his bond slave. For behold, from this time on, all generations will count me blessed, for the mighty one has done great things for me, and holy is his name. You can believe like she believed, and you can have the joy that she had in believing. Now, she goes to Elizabeth, and she goes in haste. Now, remember this. The distance between Nazareth and the hill country of Judea is a long way. We have it on a map to give you an idea. She's way up in the north in Nazareth. They didn't, in between is Samaria, but you don't go through Samaria. Why? Because they have cooties, and you don't want to get their, their dirt on your sandals. So you have to go all the way east through the other side of this, the Jordan River. That, that blue line is the Jordan River. You go up by Jericho, kind of where the children of Israel crossed under Joshua, and then you go to Jerusalem, and you come down to the hill country. It was an 80 to 100-mile trip to get there. It was a long way. But she went in haste to go there because she had to see Elizabeth. And when she was there, it was just a festival of joy. And Mary began to praise the Lord in what is called the Magnificat. It's her song of praise. What does that tell us? When you believe God, there's joy. True believers have great joy. There's no joy in disbelief. You know who was uh, kind of the poster child for disbelief? The famous, famous infidel is a French philosopher named Voltaire, lived in the 1700s. He, at the end of his life, said this, I wish I had never been born. He hated his life. No joy. There's no joy in unbelief. There's no joy in doubt. You know, people who struggle with doubts and they say, well, I, I, I kind of believe, but then I don't believe, and I kind of believe, and I don't believe, and I'm, I'm wondering, is this really true? I'm not really sure. I had a conversation with a guy just, just the other day, and, and I said, you used to, I thought you used to believe what happened. Well, now he's in this state of doubt, and there's no joy that comes across in his life. Everything that he posts on social media is just uh, filled with, with anger. Where's the joy? There's no joy in unbelief. There's no joy in doubt. There's joy in believing God. The Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 8 and 9, and though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you do not see him now, but believe in him, you greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, obtaining as the outcome of your faith the salvation of your souls. You have joy in your heart that's inexpressible. It's just there. It's constant. And now we struggle sometimes because the happiness comes and goes. But when you are focused on the Lord Jesus, there can be a constant joy, a peace that passes understanding, and a joy that comes from being right with God. So the believer has great joy, and the true believer spreads great joy. Mary was carrying around the Lord Jesus and when she came to Elizabeth, man, Elizabeth had joy. And John the Baptist, six months in her womb, he leaped for joy at the sound of her arrival, at the sound of her greeting. How could it be that the mother of my Lord would come to visit me? And she cried out with a loud voice, blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. There was joy, and they stayed together about three months. 
Mary overcame her fear. She overcame her questions. She overcame the impossible story that she was given from the angel announcements that she was given. You can do the same. God is waiting on you to simply believe him, just to believe him. I read a story this morning about a king who had two men in his prison, and they were on death row for crimes they had committed. But the king had a change of heart, and he wrote out a pardon to both of those convicted criminals who were sentenced to death, and he pardoned them both. They were free to go. And it was amazing the different responses from those two pardoned criminals. The first one saw the pardon. He was overwhelmed at the king's uh, graciousness and mercy and forgiveness and restoration. And he began to shout, and his heart was so filled with joy over what the king had done for him. The second criminal looked at his pardon and said, I don't know about this. This could be a trick. This could be a trap. This could be some sick joke that he's playing on us. I, I can't see. I know, I know that I'm guilty, so I can't see that he would pardon me. And so uh, he, he just was sour on the whole thing. He, he was trying to find all the loopholes and, and trying to find all the, the hidden flaws in the pardon. And, and uh, the other one was saying, hey, this is awesome. And he said, no, you shouldn't be excited about this because uh, I don't think this is real and I don't think this is true. You're a criminal, I'm a criminal before the Lord. On death row. We're, we're, we're on the highway to hell. And the pardon comes through the blood of the cross and through the empty tomb. And the message goes out that salvation is available to anyone who will repent and believe. What are you going to do with the pardon? Are you going to say, oh, I don't believe that. I don't think that's right. I don't think it would work like that way. As a friend of mine once said when I shared the gospel with him, he said, that is too simple. It's a simple story, so simple that a child can understand that if you'll repent and believe, the Lord of glory will come into your life and save you and change you forever. The joy of believing is waiting on you to simply believe. My friend, now is the time to do business with God. If you're watching and you're not sure about your relationship with Jesus, this is what I want you to do. Just pray and say, Lord, I want to know you in a real and personal way. I don't want to know about you. I want to have a personal relationship with you. Jesus, I'm a sinner and I'm lost and I can't save myself, but I believe that you are God in the flesh I believe you died on the cross for my sins and rose again from the dead. And right now I surrender my heart, my life to you. Come into my life, forgive me of all my sins, be my Lord and Savior. I surrender myself to you. My friend, if you'll pray that kind of prayer and mean it, the Lord will come in and your life will never be the same. I'd love to hear from you, to know that you're watching, to know that God is using this broadcast to make a difference in your life to know that you just prayed that prayer to receive Christ as Savior and Lord. Please take the time to call that toll-free number, write me, email me, let me know what's going on and how we can pray for you. You really are important to God, and you're important to us, and we're here for you. From His Heart is the viewer-supported broadcast ministry of Dr. Jeff Shreve, who believes that no matter how badly you may have messed up in life, God still loves you, and He has a wonderful plan for your life. You can find out more about that plan. Go to fromhisheart.org. Real truth, real life.